the second Sunday after Christmas Day, Almighty God, who has procured upon us, poured upon us the new light of thine incarnate word, grant that the same light kindled in our hearts may shine forth in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Maybe some of the German liberal theologians can learn that. Verse 3 of hymn 194. Jesus lives, our hearts know well. Not from us his love shall sever. Life nor death, nor powers of hell, tear us from his keeping ever. Alleluia. Well, we turn our attentions to Mr. Neander. Lectures on history, Christmas dog, Christian dogmas with a long preface by a doctor who feels the need to talk for a long time and a preface, as they always do. Neander's lectures on the history of Christian dogmas were among those to which he attached peculiar importance, which he felt special pleasure delivering. His hearers will recollect with interest his vivid delineation of the great men whose forms he summoned to pass before them, and how inspired by the power of Christian life in them, he described sympathetically the course of their development. Elevated himself by the truth and greatness of his ideas, he attracted his hearers into an admiration of their sublimity and infused into them something of the love for those great minds which filled his own heart. So he came to his field with his own apparatus, as we always say, but we'll probably hear up the road how objective he was and so scientific, etc. When obliged to animadvert on their defects, he did it earnestly, yet one who was fully conscious of his own. Neander and all he performed ever kept the ethical in closest connection with the scientific. See what I thought? <laughs> Deep truthfulness was a leading key feature of his character. Well, I hope so. It held him back from wishing to advance truth itself by disingenuous methods. Of this he gave proof frequently and plainly when his conduct was censured, as was often the case down to a recent period, by those who were imperfectly acquainted, imperfectly acquainted with his position, or less scrupulous than himself about the means they employed. It was the truthfulness also stamped on his works which inspired confidence, for few historians were so well qualified to receive and communicate the historical with unalloyed receptivity. His method was adapted to excite cautious deliberation, for he clearly marked the respective limits of probability and certainty. And when truth was found, he loved to make it fruitful by protracted contemplation. But if genuine objectivity consists not merely in confidence of assertion, but in truthful representation of fact, seldom has it been attained by a historian in so high a degree. A temptation, one of the severest, to model history according to certain preconceived aims and opinions. Everybody comes that way, whether dogmatic or not, scarcely affected him. He had overcome it beforehand by his oblivion of self. Give me a break. And would sometimes say that nothing seemed easier to him than to let historical phenomena be taken for what they were worth. And yet possessing the feelings of a powerful soul, he was decided in his likes and dislikes. Objects were not regarded by him with cold indifference. But even in writing ecclesiastical history, he was firm in his belief that the heart made the theologian. No, God makes the theologian. The same devotedness to historical fact and the same love of truth impelled him to study the most original sources of information. He wished to learn events from their actual exhibition and to see persons, as it were, face to face. He fixed his steady gaze on life in all its amplitude and depth. He 
penetrated as by div divination. <clears throat> Got a long talker telling us how great he is. Hence, when he depicted the love of the gospel in Chrysostom or its faith in Augustine, the elevated repose of the one under the storms of outward life or the inward conflicts of the other, we shall find him, find an equally sympathetic interest. He treats with the same loving thoroughness the meditative stillness of monastic life and the restless activity of Boniface. His inclination led him chiefly to the original and free developments which bordered closely on the apostolic age. But who is there, we may ask, who is traced more accurately? Scholastic speculation in its strictly ecclesiastical as well as freer forms. What we have said of Neander's method of treating persons, parties, and circumstances will equally apply to his discussion of particular dogmas. Assuming as an axiom that Christianity, subjectively considered, is the experience of the facts of redemption in the heart, but the dogmas are the intellectual expression of the Christian life, he examines them to discover how far communion with Christ is their an animating principle. But if he examines it by the Bible for its exegetical compliance. So, so the guy's writing this thing, Dr. Jacob. Every dogma to him was an answer to a question of a religious need. And he strove to ascertain what this need might be, under what conditions it originated. Yeah, so he's anthropocentric instead of bibliocentric. His patient and loving investigations were rewarded by presenting the truth in the splendor of the gold of divine truth, rescued from the distorted and decaying forms in which it lain in the age of neglect. Even in the labyrinth of the Gnostic systems, as well as under the hardest crust of scholasticism, he could decry Christian truth but with joyous satisfaction, he presented those developments, especially in which, as in the Protestant fundamental doctrines, the full contents of the evangelical consciousness were to be seen in their simplest form. Yet mindful of the apostles' words that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, he recognized in all systems something disproportionate to the eternal contents of divine revelation. There alone, the light was pure. Everywhere else was an unequal mixture of light and shade. He believed with enthusiastic confidence in the final triumph of truth, but he also knew the potency of sin and the acknowledgement of the relative necessity of erroneous manifestations was always connected in his mind with the need of mutual compliments presenting the truth in just proportions. And all of them, he admired the acts of the Paulu Poikila Sophia Tutheu. He regarded it as the highest office of his historical compositions to be a witness of it and of the peculiar power of the Christian principle of life, which harmonizing, purifying, and controlling was destined to make its way through all op opposition, obscuration, and hindrances. Of the, on this perception of a living and self-developing principle was founded the method of composing his historical works, which he was wont to call organic genetic. He possessed great tact for the detection of historical connection where to others were presented in systematic opposition. They arranged themselves for him with ease, according to the immediate and living connection of their genesis. As in the introduction to his great historical work, he refers to the parable of the grain of the mustard seed. So in the growth of the Christian life, even in its dogmatic processes, he saw it advancing from the germ to the stock, producing ever 
extending branches, flowers, and fruit. We know that his personal and scientific importance of the man by whom he was so much affected for the renovation of Christian profession and theology in our church is held in grateful remembrance and was admirably delineated not long ago by Dr. Ullman. Yet it seems undeniable that the apprehension of the simple greatness which belonged to Neander has been continually lessening among others of his contemporaries who've lost themselves among many contrarieties which should be traced up to a higher source. Many whose Christian piety he highly valued, but in whom he deemed it a defect that they valued it exclusively in their own form, fancy that they could transcend the stage of, can you turn it down a little bit? Stage of Christianity from their dogmatic standpoint, look down upon him as only half a believer. Persons of this stamp are frequently too hasty. They in their turn are again, are surpassed and must submit to be set down by those who are further advanced. There's only three quarter believers. General objections have especially been directed against the kind and method of his biblical criticism, as well as the standpoint and measure of his historical judgment. Those to whom faith and divine revelation resolves itself into mechanical and unhistorical idea of inspiration can scarcely find themselves in harmony with the childlike, humble faith and free examination of the scriptures which he knew how to maintain. Yeah, those idiots don't get it. He's not like as good as this guy. I'm better than him. I'm more pious than him. Beware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other quarters, the absence of objectivity has been complained of, sometimes because the points of view under which the developments are arranged have not been carried back to the most general forms of the intellectual process, and sometimes because they were too general and not sufficiently narrow to fit the orthodox church system. As to the former direction, it is a direct testimony to his historical tact that he divested himself of abstract forms. So that's a presupposition, unreal in their application, adhered to the real categories of real and living historical powers. In reference to the second, we remarked that he was not as Dr. Kurtz imagines, altogether prejudiced by an undervaluation or mistaken notion of the importance and value of objective ecclesiasticism. <clears throat> the description of the Middle Ages, a time when objectiveness was most vigorous in the church, might have convinced him that Neander well understood how to value this quality when it was the natural form of the growth of the Christian life. The internal and most personal were certainly of more importance to him than anything else. How about the glory of God? Divine providence. Sorry, Jacoby. The very anthropocentric, so all this bragging and carrying on. When the predominant Christian power was connected with the objective forms of the church, in the time of Abelard, he regarded their ascendancy as warranted without justifying the contemporary suppression of the germs of truth and is not confirmed by the experience of all ages that there's no fault to which a traditionary church is more prone and suspicion of every deviation and suppression of even dissent as is legitimate. If in modern times, individualism has increased to a bewildering excess, has it not been one principal reason that the rights of individuals to form their own views of the gospel were not acknowledged as they deserved either in the Middle Ages or in the later deceniums of the Reformation, to say nothing of the most flourishing periods of Protestant orthodoxy? Would Dr. Kurtz be willing to defend the manner in which Wycliffe, Huss, and John Arndt were treated 
in the name of orthodoxy and how, according to his notions, would Luther have been justified in setting himself against the objectivity of the church unless with Neander and Luther himself, he holds higher still the objectivity of the gospel. It was not Neander's wish to set aside the objectivity of the church or to subordinate it to the individual, but to contract its fear in order to give the latter liberty of action and that the pious members of the church might testify the gospel against the church. It is not easy to perceive what is to be gained by the maintenance of the objectivity of the church, especially in the Department of Historical Study, if not a word is to be said for the other factor of Christian life. Hence, we are still more surprised that so accomplished a historian as Dr. Schaff should damage by similar remarks his otherwise cordial and intelligent appreciation of Neander's historical works. We know not why it should be a matter of reproach to him, but he more or less contrasts what belongs to Christianity generally with that which belongs merely to the church. Is there an ecclesiastical communion which dare maintain that its system taken as a whole is in every particular a pure expression of the gospel? Is it not therefore a fact, this guy's weak, that these two, the Christian and the ecclesiastical, are everywhere striving at a reconcilement not yet completed, therefore must be regarded more or less in contrast relatively and according to the stage of the church's development? Nor is there much force of argument in enumerating men of various periods with collectively strictly adhered to church principles that apart from St. Bernard and similar men might have furnished for historical considerations. Can you turn it down, please? Yeah. And if every one of them had their own claims, it appears the more necessary. What is he complaining about? Hence, it may be easily explained why Dr. Connus refused to give Neander credit for depth in dogmatic discussions to judge of the correctness of his censure, we refer to his treatment of that part of history where the most profound ideas are brought under discussion. The development of Augustine and his controversy with Pelagius, of Anselm, Bernard, Thomas, Aquinas, and the Reformation, not to mention the delineation of the doctrinal teaching of the apostles. What dearer employment can there be for Christian thought than to follow everywhere the traces of the Son of God? Even Dr. Hengstenberg has acknowledged that Neander, in writing his history of the church, has opened a new path, that he had the faculty of discovering Christ everywhere, even where his image seemed to us darkened and disfigured. Neander, on his part, would have found in the excessive importance attributed to dogma in comparison with Christian life and the unseemly weight attached to the dogmatic differences of the leading Reformed communions and the Catholic over-evaluation of the authority of the Church, which conceals a Pelagianizing germ and the unevangelical idea of official sanctity and the Puseyite view of the sacraments and the introduction of the opus operatum, Lutheran theology is affected. He would probably, with greater justice, have found the remarks of an incipient shallowness, and it would not have been difficult to find traces of the same in Dr. Connus. Perhaps also it was part of Neander's deep insight into the dogmatic department that he thought the revivication of Lutheran dogma in its full extent was impossible because the necessary premises were wanted. We by no means refuse to acknowledge the talent and merit which exist on that side, but it appears to us that under the hackneyed phrases of authority and the objectivity of the church, a very pretentious subjectivity and loose caprice are frequently indulged. 
and if really an exact agreement with the entire system of church dogmas be indispensably necessary to a satisfactory Christian unity and the extension of it warrants such severe reproaches as have been excessively expressed. Instead of this, scarcely a more thorough representation of dogmatic ideas has been given against the reproach of important deviations from the view of the church. For our part, we wish to make no complaint against opponents. We only notice this connection of a far extending syncretism of doctrine, which exactly the most gifted men cannot resist. Blah, blah, blah. Hence, we can arrive at no other conclusion than that Neander's free historical composition imbued with humble devotedness to the Savior, sustained by warm sympathy and animated by his spirit. Oh, blah, blah, blah. A lot of romanticism here. I'm going to just zip through this. I can't. Okay, Mr. Jacoby. Finally. It's a long talker. History of dogma defined, relation to other branches, importance of it, right method, arrangement, sources, history of dogmas, first principle period, close of apostolic. To Gregory, period from close of apostolic age to time of Constantine, general history of dogmas, special history of dogmas, written in oral sources, inspiration, origin of God, being an attributes of God. Doctrine of Creation, Providence, the Odyssey, Trinity, Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, Anthropology, Doctrine of Christ, of course, with all that goes on, Redemption of Christ, Doctrine of the Church, Sacraments, the Lord's Supper, Eschatology, Second Period from Constantine the Great to Gregory. The Great, which I'm not sure. Special History, Scripture and Tradition, Inspiration, God, Trinity, Holy Spirit, Christ, Anthropology, Sin, Grace, and Free Will, Pelagius. I guess that's it. History defined and the history of dogmas. The two ideas, dogma and history, should be carefully distinguished. The word dogma, according to its etymology, signifies an opinion, a notion. If this is its meaning. It appears from an expression of Cratylus of Plato, Plato, Daton, Anthropon, Dogmata. So also the skeptic Sextus Empiricus in his hypostases distinguishes the different meanings of the word and says it denotes an assent to that which is not perfectly clear to the mind. He contrasts the skeptikoi, the apo, aporetikoi, and especially the empiricoi among medical practitioners who make experience their sole guide with dogmaticoi who protect it's not clear. It's spudged in the text. <clears throat> in the New Testament, the word never occurs in the sense of Christian doctrine, but only as that of a statute or decree, this dogma. To Kaiseros in Luke 2 1, Acts 17 7. To an apostle on Acts 16 4, that was smudged too. It is true that Eusebius of Caesarea and others understand the words in the epistle to the Ephesians. Namas and alone in dogma sin, relating a doctrine. Different meaning of the word in all other passages is 
presumption against such an interpretation. Moreover, it is no New Testament idea, at least of all the Pauline one, that Christ effected the abrogation of the law by his doctrine. For Christ's efficiency is attributed in the New Testament not to his teaching, but his doing and suffering. That's crap, too. This passage is therefore not against us. Dogmata is here equivalent to statutes, commandments, that is, of the Mosaic law and of the cognate signification and the law. The apostles were conscious that they imparted not subjective human knowledge, but the contents of a divine revelation, therefore made use not of dogma, but logos, to designate Christian doctrine. This distinction has been pointed out by Marcellus of Ankara in a sentence preserved to us of a work written against him by Eusebius Caesarea, taught to dogmatos anima, anthropines eke tibules, tecaid nomes. The two were standpoints by which the distinction was recognized, namely that of a harsh supranaturalism and the one diametrically opposed to a rationalism, which could find could find in the New Testament nothing but what was purely human. On the former standpoint, the phrase dogma to thea was used at an early period by the fathers of the church for logos theos. They confounded the peculiarly human apprehension of divine truth with divine truth as it is in itself. I doubt that. So that each person recognized that truth only in the form that suited his own individuality. Rightly understood the word dogma is peculiarly fitted to mark the human side and the development of human truth. History is a thing purely human. Wrong answer, August. History is theocentric, son. No sooner does human culture begin to germinate than we behold attempts at historical composition. Its office is to impart unity to consciousness of mankind when it has been divided by time. It originates in the effort to connect the present and the past and in the conviction that the vicissitudes of time are a revelation of what is eternal and divine. Everything lies within its province, which, though in itself, is unchangeable and exalted above time. It's a bunch of blah, blah. Okay, I'm going to go to the next page. I can only take so much of this guy. Verse 4, hymn 194, Jesus lives, to him the throne or all the world is given. May we go where he has gone, rest and reign with him in heaven. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord, renew again to us your sovereignty of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Godspeed. Thank <laughs> you.